I want to talk about the gifts that your parents gave you. The gifts your parents gave you. Um, I do this premarital coaching when people want to get married and they say, hey, would you do our wedding? I'm like, listen, weddings are easy to do. I can give you a great wedding. To have a great marriage, though, is a little tougher, and that actually requires a lot more work. And so we say, hey, why don't we do premarital coaching? Now, premarital coaching, in there, I do, there's one exercise I always do, and I have them draw out their family tree. You know, like, here's you, and here's your parents, and here's your grandparents. And once I have them draw out their whole tree, I just ask two questions. The, the first is this. What gifts or experience or traits did your family pass along to you that you want to keep? You're like, oh, every Christmas we did this as a family, like, and we love it. We want to, want to make it a part of our tradition. You're like, oh, that's great. Like my parents, they were really kind, kindness. We want to make that a part of our family. Like, fantastic. But then the second question, what gifts, experience, and traits did your family pass along to you that you definitely want to put an end to? Now, y'all know what that is because things will strike you. Now, Pastor Tyler and I, we were talking about this, and uh, he told me uh, that back in Arkansas, they do the same kind of family tree thing, but they do it to make sure that their family tree isn't the same tree. <laughs> yeah, that guy, he, my cousin, and I think he might be my uncle. He might even be my half-brother, too. Um, actually, I don't even know what any of that means. So two traits that might be passed down to you one of them can be really, really helpful, and the others, though, can be really unhelpful for you to have a healthy relationship in your families. And when it comes to unhealthy relationships, I think they sometimes fall into two categories. Let me give you one. One's legalism. I mean, what is that? Some of you get it. Like, you might not explain it or put words to it, but you know the feeling of it. It's all these rules without a loving relationship present. Boy, you better do this or I'm going to... Lots of rules. Now, rules aren't bad, right? Rules are good. They're healthy. Kids without rules are crazy and unhealthy. They provide us with appropriate boundaries, but rules without relationship turns into legalism. But here's the other side of it. Some of your families handed down to you not legalism, but indulgence. Indulgence. I mean, sometimes kids, they grow up watching their parents do whatever they want and indulging in things. And it, when we're talking about indulgence, we're talking about pursuing pleasures without boundaries, without rules. And here's great news for you. Whatever gift your parents gave you, you have a choice. You don't have to accept the gift. You don't have to pass along that gift to your your kids, you can actually put an end to the, the negative and the bad gifts because you have a choice about healing, development, change, and maturity, right? I, I say all this because we're in this book of Titus, and Paul wrote Titus, this young pastor, a letter and gave him the assignment on the island of Crete to pastor a group of churches so that the churches might become healthy churches. So if you go to Bible, I want you to open up uh, Titus. It's in the back. And uh, there's black Bibles right in front of you. I want you to see this. You gotta be able to read this for yourself. Don't trust me that what I put up on the screen is accurate. And so find it, figure out Titus. Some of you got phones and your Bibles are on your phone. Pull that up right now. In chapter one, here's what we know about the audience. Not, just, not the church, but all the people on the island of Crete. The island was this crazy island off the, the coast of Greece. And here's how chapter one, verse 12 describes Cretans. By the way, Cretans are our people who live on the island of Crete, right? But we have a really negative connotation of that word. Here's why. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. Titus, make a healthy church out of that. Good luck, we'll pray for you. Last week was all about the kind of behaviors that Christians have. We started in chapter two, made our way through the first 10 verses. And you might remember this when it says, hey, older men, you're supposed to behave this way. Behave in a respectful way. It was all about behavior. There's like older women, I want you to behave this way. Titus, teach them to behave that way. And then they can be an example for the younger women. Younger women, behave this way. And then the young men, behave. Well, they just gave them one word. They're like, young men, if you could do self-control, that's all we're going to ask of you right now. And so he gave them all this behavior. And in the middle of that godly behavior, it ended with this. So that in every way, 
They will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. That's the reason for the rules. The reason is that there's a world that's totally lost out there. And when we behave in a way that reflects the character of God, we're an example to them and they're going to be drawn to God. Here's why. The rules exist not just to follow rules or to test you to see if, you know, you're really going to follow God. It's actually because that's the kind of life that is good for us. It's the kind of life that has less regret and more joy. And when people look at that, they'll be drawn to Christ. So today, here's where we're going. We're at chapter 2, verse 11. 11 gives us the reason and the relationship behind those rules that we talked about last week. Now, I'm going to do a little giveaway here, okay? The giveaway is this. I'm going to tell you where we're going to go. Indulgence and legalism, they both need the same thing. Indulgence and legalism, you might think, oh, you got to cure them differently but they actually require the same thing to be fixed. And it's found in this one word, grace. The scripture I'm about to read to you, from the very beginning to the very end, is all about grace. And here's how it reads. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It, meaning grace, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority, Do not let anyone despise you. God, would you open our eyes and open our hearts right now to what these words mean and what you have to say to us today. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. From beginning to end, it's all about grace, so it begs this question, what is grace? We're gonna start this by just breaking down this text. The first is this, Uh, grace has a face, and it's the face of Jesus. If you're taking notes, here it is. Grace is Jesus. The verse starts, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. So grace shows up. It showed up at a specific time in a specific place to offer salvation to people. It's not an abstract concept. It's the concept that someone showed up to show God's grace and that grace was Jesus. So grace has a face. And don't miss who salvation was for. What kind of people is salvation for? It's for, not a trick question. Stay with me, people. Come on. Grace is for all people. We read just previously in verses 1 through 10, there's older men there. There's younger men, older women. There's younger women. And then there was a breakdown there that says, hey, slaves and masters, these are how you are to treat each other. And we, we talked about how that's not an approval of slavery, Paul is just speaking to a context that existed back then. But when he says all people, make note of this. Jesus offered salvation to all people, regardless of socioeconomic status, gender, about how well you were doing or how bad you were doing in society. So just when it says all people, I want you to hear me, that means you. I don't know where you came from. Maybe you just walked out of a gang last week. I don't know. Maybe you just walked out of your office and there's so much corruption there and some of it's on you. Maybe you just walked out of a marriage and maybe you feel like the victim or maybe you know you're the perpetrator or maybe it's both. And you're like, no, all people doesn't mean me because my story is busted and broken and messed up. I just want you to hear this. Grace is here for you. Jesus is here for you. He died for you. This grace has appeared that offers salvation to all people, which means you as well. Now, when you hear the word grace, here's what I want you to envision and imagine. Whenever I speak this word grace today, I just want you to think Jesus. Now, when it says grace appeared, right, we get that at Christmas time, right? I mean, grace appeared. It was a baby, right? But when Paul is writing about this to Timothy, what he means is this, that grace appeared. And when you hear the word grace, it's not just about Jesus appearing as a baby or stepping into his ministry as a a young man. When he goes through it, it's all about his appearing all the way through his, his step into ministry and his claim 
to be God's son, his claim to be divine, all the times that he claimed that he would die and then three days later come back to life. That's all about his grace. And then when he does come back to life, I mean, Jesus died on a cross and his followers were like, all right, game over. We're going home until three women go to his grave that Sunday morning and the tomb is empty and Jesus appeared to them, starts appearing to other people and over a process of 40 days, shows himself to more than 500 people. And then after those 40 days, ascends into the heavens and he says this, I'm coming back. When, it's, when Paul writes, and grace appeared, he's talking about the entire story. So number two, grace is this. It expects us to say no. That's actually what verse 12 is about. It, grace, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Now, when a person recognizes God's grace to them in Jesus, and they become a Christian, Please make note of this. They are actually committing themselves to say no to certain indulgences in life. And let's be clear about this. There are some people who think, oh yeah, yeah. When you become a Christian, that's where the fun ends. <laughs> that's where you stop having a good time. Those people who make that same statement will leave a path of wreckage in their life and have stories of regret. Because <laughs> what he's Saying, hey, by the way, when you say no to ungodliness, you're saying no to destruction in your own life and other people's life. It's actually the good life that you crave. A life of being loved by God and learning how to effectively love the people in your life and receive love from other people. But it expects us to say no. Let me make sure I get all of verse 12 because grace, number three, also expects us to say yes. And here's how it reads. It, grace, teaches us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Those are three things. Self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Let me run through those really quick. Self-control, that's your relationship with yourself. That you can actually do the things that when you say yes, you'll do it, and you say no, you're not gonna do it. It's a relationship with your, yourself showing goodness and control over yourself. Upright, it's this concept, that how I behave towards you is good towards you. When it says godly, that's about reflecting the character of the relationship that you have with God. All three of these, you say yes to how you control yourself, how you are to other people, and who you are in reflecting God's character. Make sense? So how does grace teach us to say no to indulgence and yes to relationship with God and godly behavior? This is such a great question. Because don't you want it to just be, oh, listen, you accept Jesus in your life and like, he changes you. He just does it for you. You're like a different person, brand new in Christ, right? And like, you don't even have to do anything. You don't have to work at it. He just changes you. Like all the things you used to crave that weren't good, all those indulgences, like they all just went away. I'm curious, how many of you who are Christians today, when you became a Christian, God took away all your bad cravings, please raise your hand and we'll celebrate the miracle. I'm not saying it can't happen. There are people who are like, listen, I crave alcohol since the time I was 13. I was drunk for 30 years. I gave my life to Christ. The craving was gone that day. Hallelujah, it's a miracle. And I, I don't say that in a mocking way. We'll celebrate that because it does happen. But when it says grace teaches us to say no, we're like, how? Because if that didn't happen for all of us, it maybe it happened a different way. Let me give you a couple examples. Does grace teach us the rules? I'll say it differently. Does grace give us the expectations? And the answer is yes. Now, this is not in your notes. You might write this down. Grace gives us expectations. When you look at the story of Jesus, you're gonna see love. When you see the story of Jesus, you're gonna see generosity and sacrifice. You're gonna see kindness. God didn't have to forgive us. You know that. He could have allowed the world that was living in rebellion against him, and then when people died, he could have said, listen, go ahead. You've wanted to live without me your entire life, so now in this afterlife, after you die, you're gonna get what you've always wanted. Life without me, which is actually an existence in hell, that's not cruel, that's actually fair. For him to give us just what we've wanted, life without him. 
But when we get saved, and you look at how gracious and loving his offer of salvation is, that actually creates the same expectation. I mean, Jesus got down and washed his disciples' feet, and he's like, now that I served you like this, here's what you do. You go do it to everybody else. It's the expectation. How does grace teach us? It sets the expectation in our life. You want to love your wife? Take a look at Jesus' kindness. Look at his generosity. Look at his sacrifice. Model your marriage after that. You want to know how to love your husband? Model your life after the way Jesus treated people. Serve him. Now, there's two more ways that grace teaches us, I think. Question, does grace change us? Does something happen in us and God do something? Or, or, or does grace teach us like, hey, like, it's, it's up to you to learn. You've all had those classes in college, right? Where it was the, the teacher's responsibility to teach you and you showed up to the class and you're like, there is no teaching happening right now. You had to teach yourself everything in the course. It's like self-taught, right? I hate those classes. I want to show up. You're smarter than I am. You know, like the group experience class where you all show up and just share like what you learned. I'm like, this is the blind leading the blind. Does God do anything in you when you come to him? Romans 12, 2 says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. It does not say transform yourself. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. God's not gonna change you apart from you. You gotta come in and say, God, I'm gonna fill my mind with your word. I'm gonna fill my mind with things that are true, things that are righteous, things that are good, things that are beautiful. And as I do, he will transform you. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Not only that, but we'll get to a verse that many of you probably know, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, in Christ means this, you're a follower of Jesus. You've committed your life to following him. You've received his gift of forgiveness. It says the new creation has come. There's something inside of you that God birthed. The old has gone and the new is here. I believe that grace teaches us. One of the things it does is it changes us. It doesn't do the work necessarily for us, but I think God partners with us. And anything good that has changed in us, as we put it in our heads, God's the only one who can take it to our hearts and change our hearts. Third thing, I think grace motivates us. And I think this is actually the main reason why Paul writes this. He wrote this section of scripture so that we would, oh, we'd remember grace. We would think about it. We'd remember Jesus. We would linger over the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus so that we could absorb it completely, retell it, relive it in our minds so that we would be motivated to live godly lives. Three things. Grace gives us expectations. Grace changes us. And grace motivates us. But for that to take place, we got to linger over grace. We gotta breathe it in, we gotta see it. We gotta read it. We have to try to relive the experience and that's what Paul means when he says grace teaches us. And the fourth thing is that grace culminates in glory. Next verse says this, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why should we not live like Cretans? Because there's not one appearing, there's two appearings. Remember verse 11, it says that grace appeared and that's like, you think Christmas, baby Jesus, but that whole grace thing is his whole life. But there's a second appearing that's gonna happen here. We wait for that blessed hope, the appearing of the glory. It's not the grace of Jesus that's gonna appear, it's the glory of Jesus because he came first as a baby. He's gonna come back as a king though. He's gonna come back in glory and the whole world will recognize it. But notice how Jesus is described. Our great God and savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, stay with me, I'm gonna get deep or technical for a minute. Theologians have spent a lot of time wondering about that phrase. Look at it. Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Is that one or two people? Is it our great God, as of like our great God the Father, and Savior, Jesus Christ? If it's two people, that means the Father and the Son both appear at this second coming in glory. If it's actually only referring to Jesus, Listen how Jesus is described. Our great 
God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Maybe this isn't hard for you to understand and you've believed it all your life that Jesus was God, is God. This is the most direct statement, I think, in all the scriptures that talks about the deity of Jesus Christ. And I believe that because of this. There's not a single verse in, in the entire New Testament that talks about the Father coming back in this reappearing in glory. It's always about Jesus returning. Jesus is our great God. I mean, how else could a person predict their own death and resurrection and then make it come true? The story of grace is going to culminate in this moment of glory for those who belong to Jesus. And it begs this question. Do you belong to Jesus? I, I try not to get too confrontational in a room and kind of get in your grill about stuff. We invite people to Jesus. We don't chastise them into it. But every now and then, you need a really blunt question so that people can hear it. Do you belong to Jesus? Do you believe in the story of grace that he came as a babe, predicted his own death and resurrection, and then the Romans nailed him to a cross? Do you believe that he physically died, didn't pass out, died, and Sunday morning came back to life? It's actually a historical event in history, verified more than any other historical event in the history of the world. But do you believe it's true? And after 40 days, hundreds and hundreds of people saw him alive. Do you believe that? Here's a slightly different question, because just believing that doesn't make you Christian. Have you committed your life to following him, to receive his forgiveness, because you believe he paid on the cross for you, and then... As a part of that commitment, it's this. It's what Paul wrote to Titus. There are expectations on your life that you live in relationship with him and your character changes. I'm not asking the question, are you perfect? There is no perfection. But are you living by your own expectations and your own rules? Or do you live every day in relationship with him? Because if he's coming in glory and he's bringing you into glory that day for all those who follow him, are you following him? For some of you, you've never accepted Jesus in your life. And for others of you, you prayed a prayer one day. And I'm not questioning your faith, but if the story of your life is I prayed a prayer and now I live however I want, I will question whether on that day of glory, you'll be thrilled about it. It's worth asking the question. Um, and then we get this fantastic verse that is all about who Jesus is. When you hear Jesus, hear grace. When you hear grace, think Jesus. It says this in verse 14. Look in your Bibles. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, uh, to redeem us from all wickedness, to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Now, I'm going to take each of those phrases and just show you like a different way to say it, because it's like you want to grab onto each word and ask, what does it mean? There's this phrase in there, who gave himself for us. What does it mean? It means grace is freely given. It's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't steal it. You can't borrow it. He gave it and he paid for it. When it says to redeem us, the word literally means paid for us. Do you recycle it all? You bring your trash and then they pay you for it. You're actually redeeming that. Jesus redeemed us. He paid for us on the cross. And then what it says to purify for himself, which means this, grace cleanses us. A people that are his very own. It means this grace has adopted us. Eager to do what is good. That means he changes us. He motivates us to live out the character of God in the world around us. Because grace comes with expectations, it's actually a gift to us. Because when God changes us and we start living for him, we actually know that we truly have an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus, 
Grace has been so good to us, so generous, and it offers us life change. I mean, you could take each of those phrases and build an entire message out of that. Just for example, when it says, he purifies for himself. Just pause and linger over that. He purifies, cleanses, washes clean, which means the dirt and the, the sin is gone. But notice this. Think about this for a minute. If he does that, then what do you have to be guilty or ashamed for? People carry guilt and shame around as if it's their friend. But that friend keeps beating them up and abusing them. But we keep welcoming that friend as if they're really a friend. And they're not. When Jesus purified us, he's like, you don't have to live with guilt. You can live with joy. You don't have to live with shame. You can live with openness to freely engage people. Because people with guilt and shame, they beat themselves up and they hide from people. And there's Christians who are living their whole lives as if guilt or shame were this badge of honor or something that they just don't want to release. Why don't you let that abusive friend go today? Do you see how great grace is? It teaches us to live differently. Last thing is just this. Grace stands against culture. Look, look how Paul wraps this up. He says, these then are the things that you should teach. W what are these things? It's about the grace of God and the expected behavior that goes for people who call themselves Christians. These are the things that you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Don't let anyone despise you. Titus, young pastor, that community on Crete, they're not gonna wanna hear that there are expectations that God has for their lives. I mean, they're Cretans, right? <laughs> they're lazy gluttons and liars. Like, they don't want to hear that there's a standard for their life. Don't you, young man, give an inch to that lie that says, oh, you know what, just let people do whatever they want. No, 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 no. You, pastor, you teach. You teach with all seriousness. Encourage them. You be bold about it. You tell them about the grace of God that took the life of Jesus, sacrificed it for their cleansing, their forgiveness, so they could have a relationship with God. You preach the grace of God with power, but please Preach the expectation that is for believers. Are you with me? That's going to go against the culture of our day because the culture of our day will see this. Don't define me. Don't tell me what I should do. I, I want to create my own boundaries because mine are a lot easier to live by. And when I don't live by, I can move them. You with me? Let me ask you just two final questions. What happens when grace isn't followed by change? You know, you become a Christian and you don't change or you don't feel like anything changes in you. Let me give you a few things. Grace without expectation is indulgence. Someone who becomes a Christian and they're like, I'm gonna do whatever I want is a life of indulgence. There's another group that grace without relationship is legalism. There's some people, they meet Jesus and they're like, I got to follow all the rules. And their life is focused on following rules instead of enjoying a relationship. Can you imagine marrying somebody like that? Maybe you can. I don't know. What I mean is, um, <laughs> I think I just dug a hole off script. We're in trouble. Uh, you know, you marry somebody and like, by the way, now that we're married, here's all the rules you have. And you're like, whoa. We're not going on any more dates. Don't worry about that. We're not celebrating anniversaries. The thing that we're really going to celebrate is when you follow the rules. Could you imagine that kind of marriage? Please say no, okay? It'd be terrible. It's legalism. When you get married and the advice is, hey, still date your spouse, right? Celebrate your anniversary. Tell them how much you love them. It's all about the relationship. The Christian faith is all about this relationship with God. But grace without expectation, marriage without expectations, hey, by the way, you're gonna be faithful to me, right? Okay, so there's some rules and boundaries on that. And the Christian faith says, reflect the character of God. But grace without relationship leads to legalism. Now, here it is. I want you to get this. Indulgence and legalism require the same response. What both of them need is to understand grace. I think we need an experience where we re-examine what grace is. Listen, listen, listen. We open God's word and we linger over the story. 
We linger over it long enough that we know it. And we linger over it long enough that it somehow trickles down to our hearts so that we start caring about the things that God cares about. I think it requires, second, a decision. It's not just an experience, but it's a decision. It's a commitment on your behalf that you're going to walk with Jesus, live in relationship with him. It's a decision to say, I accept your grace. An experience, a decision is always followed by habits that reinforce our relationship with Jesus. It's not just habits about obey, obey, obey. But do you, do you have the habit? I have the habit of dating my wife Friday nights. I'm not perfect. Some, we miss some Fridays. But I, we, we go out together. It's a habit, but it's a habit that reinforces the relationship, not just obedience. Are you with me? It's a habit that's fun. I think there's habits that need to adopt the character of Jesus. But I think those will save you from legalism and indulgence. So let me get real practical. I've talked about lingering over grace. How do you do that? I mean, the last question is this. How do you keep grace in your mind so that it leads to change? Can I just give you some real practical things? And this is a brainstorm. I would ask this question today over lunch with your family or your friends, whoever's here. Like, how, how do you linger over grace? Let me give you a couple ideas. You write your own definition. Put it in your own words. You can't change what grace is, okay? I'm not saying you got the power to do that. I'm just saying put it in your own words so that it becomes more real to you, grittier to you. What if you wrote about when you first discovered God's grace? That's your story, so that you would remember your story. Some of you, you haven't told your story in decades. What if you actually opened the Bible and you just looked at every place in the New Testament that had grace? What if you created a grace card? Now, I don't even know what this is. I don't know, maybe it's a card that has grace and examples and key verses of it and like what, what grace actually is and you kept it with you. I don't know, maybe, ladies, come on. You got plaques in your home, right? Banners that say, welcome home. We have one that's like Simrock family established in like, they're cool, right? They just remind you like, these are who we are. I mean, what if you had a grace banner in your house? Sounds like a good Father's Day gift. Okay. I mean, maybe it's digital and it's on your phone. It's your screensaver, but it's something that is gritty for you that, that, that speaks of God's grace. I don't know. Maybe some of y'all need a new tattoo, whatever. What if you wrote your story of when God met you with grace? What if you shared your story? Next seven days, you share God's story of how he met you with grace with someone. I would almost dare you to try that. What if instead of telling your story, what if you determined in the next seven days you were going to show up in someone else's life and show them grace? Would a life like that start transforming who you are? So, I want to end with this. If you're not a Christian and you want to become a Christian today, I've really laid out the good news of the gospel today. If you want to become a Christian today, I want you to have that conversation with God right now. You don't even have to listen to the rest of what I say today. You just bow your head, receive his gift, acknowledge that Jesus paid for your sins. He covers your guilt by his death on the cross. And if you want that, commit your life to walk in relationship with him. It's those two things. It's receiving that gift and committing your life back to him. It's both of those. Now, if you're a Christian, but you realize you have not said no to ungodly things in your life, and you know it. I mean, talk about guilt and shame, and you're like, oh, let's move on to the next part. That's me. Would you recommit your life to him today? I mean, you've already believed in who Jesus is and what he's done for you. You say, yes, I want that. But that whole commitment to the expectations of what grace looks like, and it's not about trying harder. It's about a developing those habits of grace where you linger over. Maybe for you, today is your day to recommit to that. And I, I would challenge you, if you're not a Christian and today you're becoming a Christian right now, or if you're recommitting your life to Christ, don't let it be a secret. That's the thing that the devil uses to keep us off track. Tell someone. Today, we're going to finish by doing what Christians did for the last 2,000 years. We're going to receive communion. Around the room at these tables, there's bread 
in these cups, and on the other side, there's juice. And um, The reason we do this is because Jesus, with his disciples, the night before he went to the cross, he broke bread with his disciples, and he said, this is my body that's broken for you. And he took wine, and he said, um, this is the symbol of blood. This is the symbol of my blood. This is going to be shed for the forgiveness of your sins. This is this new covenant that we're going to make. And so for the last 2,000 years, we do this to linger over the grace of God. You know that every week we make this available to you at the tables? And let me just say, some of you are wondering, like, well, when do we do that? I'm kind of unsure. Like, do we just go up, do whatever we want? Listen, whenever we're singing or after the service, you can walk up as a part of your expression of worship and receive that. And so today we're going to receive that together. I'm going to pray in just a moment and then invite you, if you're a Christian, to go receive that and linger over that for a moment. Give Jesus thanks for it. Would you spend a moment, too, confessing your sin and how you've got it wrong this week? And if you're not a believer, then don't do this because this is for people who are followers of Jesus to remember him and show gratitude for him. But if you're a person who right now, you're going to give your life to Jesus, then you can join us. This is one of those moments where I think grace can change us. So let's bow our heads before God. Lord, um, I thank you for your grace. And I admit that there's moments where it is not on my mind enough. And Lord, I admit this, that there's still a work that you are doing in my heart to make me more like you. But today we give you thanks. Jesus, thanks for your obedience. Thanks for your willingness to love us and sacrifice for us. Thank you that you're not done with us yet, that you love us in all the messiness and muddiness of our lives. But I would pray for those in this room right now, God, that you would meet us in such a personal way that those who don't know you, that they're crossing the line of faith right now by proclaiming, Jesus, thank you. I believe in your death for me. I accept that gift of forgiveness. And I commit my life to follow you. For those that are praying that, God, I pray that this would be the flag in the sand moment that from this point on, they are changed. And for those Christians that are wandering, God, I pray that you just bring a, a heap load of conviction right now. Not to bring guilt, God, but, but so that they would say, yes, I, I got to come back to you, God. Would you do that all over this room? And we just ask this in all humility, God, would you change us so that we might know your grace again and again and again? We pray it in Jesus who loves us, died for us, and saves us. In his name we pray, amen.